I'd like to welcome everyone to our IMAG MSM working group on multi-scale modeling viral pandemics. It's the 27th of May, the last meeting of May. And we have two diverse speakers lined up, uh, Phil Ball and uh, Miriam Rafailovich. Um, so because of the diversity of speakers, I have set up some breakout rooms for the discussion. Uh, so I'll assume we'll use those. I need to remind you that the meeting is being live streamed on YouTube and the meeting will be available uh, archivally in public uh, in the future. As always, uh, myself, James Glazier, uh, Reinhard Labenbacher in his new house in Florida, uh, Bruce Shapiro and Jim Sluka, we're always here to try to help out and to uh, respond to suggestions, comments, and criticisms. We have our usual channels of communication. They only work if you use them, so please help us out. In particular, we have a nice library of YouTube videos uh, of all of the talks that have been given uh, in the past months. A lot of them are very good. Uh, if you can help us uh, bring them to people's attention, we'd appreciate that. Uh, we have a LinkedIn page. Uh, we have the IMAG MSM Wiki page that always needs love and content. Uh, we have a Twitter feed and a Slack channel. So please help us out uh, spreading the word about these meetings and about the work that's being done by the working group. And now I will open the floor to announcements. Does anyone have any uh, announcements for this week? Please feel free to speak up if you have any announcements. We do have, Reinhardt, we have a steering committee meeting tomorrow. Is that correct? That's correct. So if you're in doubt about whether you're a member of the steering committee uh, or you think you should be and you're not invited, please let us know. Um, but we'll have our usual steering committee meeting tomorrow morning at 11. Any other announcements on uh, funding, publications, workshops? Okay, uh, we have uh, two new wiki pages, um, a wiki page for publications uh, related to the topic of the working group. So anything to do with infection, immune response, uh, viral replication and so on, please let us know and we can put it on the wiki and also a highlight, we'll have a rotating highlights uh, to give your work a little bit of extra uh, exposure. Um, there also is a site where you can post news items of interest uh, that you think are relevant to the working group. And so I strongly suggest, please help us with that. There are a lot of interesting uh, pieces that might be relevant. Uh, Jim Sluka is your point man to talk to on these two uh, new projects. Our schedule for upcoming meetings and mini seminars uh, is as follows. We have Alan Lloyd and Amanda Randalls next week, uh, Charles Taylor and Addie Stern the week after that, and then Chantal is going to be talking about aerosols June 17th, and that's uh, what I have on the agenda so far. As always, we would very much appreciate suggestions for future speakers. Don't be shy about suggesting yourself as a speaker. Uh, if you spoke last week, maybe not, but uh, if you spoke early on in the seminar series and you have a lot of exciting new results or you didn't say all the things that you wanted to say the first time, uh, please feel free to put yourself up uh, again for another talk. As always, uh, we're going to plan on hearing the two talks first uh, to make sure that both of our speakers have all of their time. And I'm actually looking online to make sure that, uh, is Miriam on the call? I 
don't see. Bruce, can you possibly check up on that? Yes, I will. Uh, it may be that Philip has a lot more time than we expect. Um, I can always find things to say. Uh, so uh, uh, typically uh, we, so our typical, so just for reference, our typical policy, since it's, it's a tight time, is that we go through both talks and then do the questions after the both talks. Uh, but uh, you're free to uh, run your, your section as you wish. Uh, typically on the order of 15 to 20 minutes of presentation, followed by, uh, because we lose a little bit of time at the beginning, and then a half an hour of open discussion uh, between 4 and 4.30. And if it looks like people are going to be overrunning their time, I'll give a five-minute warning. So please don't be offended if I break in on that. Okay. And then we'll move directly to Philip. Uh, as people know, I don't do elaborate introductions, I'd rather save the time for our speakers. Uh, he's somebody that I think many of us know his writings uh, and we're very pleased that he's willing to talk to us today. And with that, no more ado, I can ask people, I guess, to mute if you're not speaking and I'll turn the screen share over to Phil. Thanks very much, James. Uh, let's see where I am now. Okay, let's see if I can get this up and going and get the show running here. Uh, so what I will do is find the button to start the show, the presentation. Okay, there we go. Yes, well, thank you very much, uh, James, for asking me to come along. It's very interesting to be speaking to, to your group about kind of what I do, or certainly what I've been doing over the past year, because it probably goes without saying that this has been an extraordinary year and a half, pretty much, for a science communicator. And if the events hadn't been so traumatic and horrific, I'd be tempted to call it interesting, even exhilarating. Like, so like many of my colleagues, I've spent these times writing almost exclusively stories related to COVID in one way or another. Um, you know, as when this thing started, as these rumors started to spread of this new virus that had emerged in China that seemed to cause respiratory problems, this was in early January of last year. I, like many science reporters, I could see the echoes of the alarms that were raised in previous outbreaks of viral infectious diseases like bird flu and swine flu and SARS. And I'd written a little bit about those cases, but I didn't really consider global health and infectious disease to be my primary territory. So I figured I'd keep an eye on development, but leave the reporting to the many excellent science writers who do specialize in those subjects. But it soon became clear to me that this was bigger than that, that it was actually too big for anyone in a job like mine to ignore. And the Truth dawned on me when I was asked to write a piece on the subject uh, for a British newspaper and I cycled, I guess this was in February of last year, I cycled into central London, the last time I'd been into central London, uh, and uh, to talk to a, a leading epidemiologist and what he said, and in particular the way he said it, um, uh, made me realise that things, everything was about to change. You know, I, I reached out to shake his hand to greet him instinctively uh, back then and he, um, you know, made it clear that this was... The, the time for doing that had passed. And so I realized um, that uh, this was going to be something that I was going to be not just writing about a lot, but like the rest of us living through for a considerable time to come. And for the rest of the year, and for much of this one, uh, most of the journalism that I produced is in some way or another connected to the pandemic. And I realize this makes me one of the lucky ones because as a freelancer, I work from home anyway. And because of the nature of my job, the pandemic has actually been a source of work rather than an obstacle to it. So it's been a very busy and productive time. But that task wasn't always quite what I anticipated at the outset. Naively now, looking back, I figured that science writers like me would be trying to keep people informed and up to speed on the latest scientific developments in trying to tackle the, the spread of the virus. So very early on, for example, I wrote this piece um, about the development of uh, the very early development of, vac of vaccines. And um, I spoke in particular to Barney Graham at the uh, NIH about Moderna's efforts there. But it soon became clear that our job was going to have another element that um, 
was at least as important, if not more so, than talking strictly about the science. Because never before have we seen how intimately linked science is to society at large, to politics, to globalization, to social trends, to the media, industry and business. So this has been an opportunity and one that I welcome, actually, to show that science is deeply embedded in our society and in politics and in culture and that it's a two way interaction. And over the past year, we've seen that truth play out in real time and in open view for better and worse. And for this reason, I think we've seen how urgent it is for what I regard as science commentary or even science criticism, which I've long argued should actually be a much more widely recognized aspect of science communication. During the pandemic, we've seen issues in science and public health being manipulated and abused by all kinds of parties, including governments, um, as you will know. We've seen how technologies of misinformation developed over the past several years for political purposes mostly, can be put into the surface service of distorting the scientific agenda. We've seen science deified as a false saviour for a crisis that is partly of socio-economic origin. And we've seen scientists actively collude with some of this. Um, we've seen all this happen. I, I've seen all this happen mostly from a UK perspective, but there have been plenty of parallels, I think particularly between the UK and the US, um, where the pandemic, of course, has been even more politically polarised and entangled with wider social issues and actually, in the end, politically transformative. So the, the role of science communicator then has, to my mind, been not just as a translator of technical issues, but as a creator of the kind of context that no other group seems willing or able to provide. And I think we've now, what I think we've we see now that the importance of science communication and the responsibility that goes with it is sometimes deeper than I think people in my profession have recognized. And I'm not blowing my own trumpet here. My professional colleagues have done much more than me to provide the bigger picture of the pandemic. So the pieces by Ed Yong in The Atlantic have been vital documents for making sense of what has been happening, especially in the US, and reporting by the likes of Helen Branswell at Stat News, um, Amy Maxman at Nature, Deborah McKenzie for New Scientist, and in her astonishingly quick book on COVID and astonishingly good, and Gretchen Vogel and Kai Kuferschmidt for Science, um, has to my mind been more reliable than pretty much anything I've seen coming out of many scientific and health and academic institutions. They've helped to reconcile and evaluate sometimes conflicting results and opinions from scientific researchers and institutions. And in doing so, I think they've performed a vital public service. And I'm actually very proud of what my profession generally has achieved. Of course, all this is set against the sometimes dangerously deceitful messages that have come from other regular news media. Never before, I think, has it been so nakedly apparent that much of our media is driven by ideology more than by a respect for facts. And I'm afraid that's an attribute that in the UK we seem now to be importing from, uh, from the US, although we've got plenty of homegrown versions of our, of our own. Um, and never before have the stakes been so high. The simple and awful fact is that lies spread by politicians and others with the assistance of their media advocates have played a significant role in the appalling death toll globally from COVID-19. And I'm gonna be frank with you here, while many individual scientists have really distinguished themselves in their readiness to speak out against these kind of lethal abuses of authority and influence, the scientific community as a whole has, I think, so far failed to hold those responsible to account. And sometimes I think it's even been complicit. Certainly, I think that's true in the UK. You can judge for yourselves whether it's true in the US. And it seems that science communicators may need to take on uh, that role of holding to account. And in my view, this is fundamental anyway to what science communication is about, as Deborah Bloom uh, recently eloquently expressed in this article for Science. We're not here to cheerlead for science, even though on occasion there's a case for doing that. So the pandemic has illustrated with unprecedented clarity and urgency the several roles that I think science communication should play. And one of them, is as a discerning broker of scientific information. 
never before can I recall a time when scientific understanding was so fast moving, so uncertain and so disputed in a matter of such huge importance. Right from the outset, there were vital questions about the virus and its effects that were very difficult to answer and on which there was a lot of conflicting information. For example, how did the virus originate? I mean, Crikey was saying that uh, argument still uh, still go on, you know, more intensely than ever, perhaps just at the moment. How transmissible is it? How lethal is it? Who is most susceptible? How is it transmitted? Is it airborne or is it via surfaces? What are the best protective measures? Masks, social distancing, lockdowns? How much transmission is asymptomatic? Which antivirals, if any, are of any use? All of these things have been hotly debated, of course. And now, of course, how safe are the vaccines? How well were they tested? What are the risks of side effects? Even from respected sources like the World Health Organization, the information about some of these questions has been conflicting and ambiguous. In those circumstances, it would be too much to expect science communicators to answer questions on which even the experts don't agree. But what they can do is to explain what is and what is, what is not known with confidence and assess the degree of trust that can be placed in the different sources, the different voices. And frankly, some scientists haven't been reliable sources at all. Uh, there have, for example, been some extremely incautious and premature things said early in the pandemic about the value of masks, about the nature of transmission, about the likely extent of infection in the population. Far worse is the way we've seen some scientists, including some very prominent ones, display the all too human tendency to double down on mistakes. And nowhere, I think, is that more clear than in the notorious Great Barrington Declaration, which advocates a strategy of so-called focused protection, in effect, herd immunity by natural infection rather than lockdowns. To my mind, the motivation behind that idea is clearly now ideological rather than scientific. Uh, the idea, I think, is being advocated by what the historian of science, Naomi Oreskes, has called merchants of doubt. While the scientific community is, in my experience, boundless, generous, and mostly dependable as a source of expert advice, it's not always terribly good at the bigger picture. For example, it became clear to me quickly that the misinformation was going to be huge in the pandemic. I mean, I don't, you know, plenty of people realise that, and there were many good researchers uh, working very hard to understand the channels of misinformation uh, that was, uh, you know, that were uh, 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 spreading false ideas about COVID and how to stem it. But in this piece, I argued that efforts like this can't ignore the way political developments over the past several years have actively cultivated a misinformation ecosystem that enables these things. So it's not all about anti-vax trolls and Russian state misinformation agencies. The pandemic has challenged the habitual way that scientific issues are usually separated from social and political ones. For example, we've seen that we can't tech our way out of a problem that has strong socioeconomic components. It's become lethally clear that social inequality, both nationally and globally, is an urgent public health issue. Um, and this is, the, uh, this is the kind of uh, science message that science communicators must try to get across. And this is an example of a piece where I've tried to do that. So, you know, we have to go beyond simply explaining how mRNA vaccines work. And there's a broader element to this, which is about the organization and the status of the sciences themselves. And I would argue that much of the response to this crisis from the traditional hardcore, the, the traditional core of hard sciences has been first class. So the virus was identified quickly, sequenced quickly, tests were developed fast, um, work on vaccines and antivirals has been astounding. Hard questions have at least been partly asked, uh, answered about the epidemiology and the etiology of COVID-19. But some of the biggest problems and oversights have arisen in the interface of science and society and healthcare in unglamorous, low status areas such as supply chains, community health programs, residential care facilities, public messaging to diverse communities. These aspects are rarely written about, at least in the you know, science media, and they don't have high tech allure, but they, I mean, they barely in some cases be seen even as soft, let alone hard science, but they've never been more vital 
and this is a potential blind spot both for the scientific community and for science communicators and we should learn from that. Meanwhile, the idea that scientists can offer objective apolitical advice to politicians and leaders has I think been exposed as a fantasy. Um, I I've seen scientists trying to cling to that cosy notion which is why science communication needs to point out what is not being said elsewhere, either by scientists or news reporters or politicians. It should both explain and critique how science works. This was illustrated yesterday here in the UK. It was an insane day with the explosive testimony to uh, a hearing in the British Parliament from the former chief advisor to the prime minister, Dominic Cummings, who left his post under a cloud at the end of last year. Um, and he painted an utterly horrific picture of the incompetence and neglect in government, both in the first wave in the spring of last year and the even worse second wave in the autumn. Um, but there's um, there's there's been a massive political commentary about this in the newspapers today, but a very, very little discussion of the flaws that Dominic Cummings rightly point identified in the scientific advice that fed into the government's initial pandemic strategy. And so this piece that I uh, published yesterday evening argued that the scientific community needs to hold its own accounting of what went wrong to lead evidently good scientists to evidently bad conclusions. And I have to tell you, this is not something that many British scientists seem to want to hear. To be honest, I, I genuinely fear now that there will be a conspiracy of silence about the errors for the Bre very British reason, I suspect, of not wanting to seem indecorous about it and to criticize people. This is what we science communicators have to be here for, even if it means we won't be courting favor with some scientists. And I see this as a matter of trust, of sustaining public trust in science through openness and transparency and self-reflection. And this issue of trust has been essential to so much of this business and it continues to be. So we've seen some media outlets abuse trust by promoting blatant misinformation or giving a prominent platform to marginal views. And in this respect. I think science journalism has a duty to put its own house in order and to hold others, including our colleagues in the media, to account. Trust, of course, is never less than uh, never less central uh, than now in the vaccine rollout. We've just been talking about that. It's been vital that communicators try to inform clearly and accurately and objectively, um, uh, you know, what uh, what all of this is about. And while the speed of vaccine development was a triumph for science, it's quite natural that it's created some public unease. And so we need to explain very clearly how it's been possible to get vaccines this quickly without compromising on safety trials. It's quite natural that the problems that have arisen of side effects like blood clotting um, have created public concerns. And so we need to find ways of putting those into perspective. And that's not going to happen just by throwing statistics at people. We have to find another way to do that. Science communicators have needed to challenge some of the questionable decisions made by leaders and regulatory agencies in the light of things like the vaccine side effects and how they, that has been politicized, how the safety issues have been politicized that certainly happened in, in Europe. We need also, I think, to call out some of the troubling developments about intellectual property and patents from pharmaceutical companies that have been hampering the rollout of vaccines globally. So with all of this, I think COVID-19 has taken the lid off science. It's revealed it as fallible and uncertain, as well as immensely powerful and effective, and of course, essential. It's complicated the image of science as a source of perfect and objective knowledge. And I think mostly that's a good thing. Parallels have often been drawn with the way climate change has been handled in the media over the past several years. Some have said that the pandemic has been like the, all the potential disruption of climate change condensed into a year. So there are surely lessons to be learned from it about how, for example, to convey uncertainty in areas like climate science while minimizing the potential for that to be exploited to sow confusion and misinformation. And my fondest hope then is that from this 
terrible global catastrophe that has exposed all manner of political and social ills, but has also given us many examples of tremendous ingenuity, and bravery and integrity and humanity. From all of this, my hope is that the communication and the discussion of science will emerge with a new sophistication, a greater depth and maturity, and a recognition that it can't achieve its full potential and value without being embedded within and engaged with its cultural context. So that's what I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you very much, that was brilliant. Um, Reinhardt, how do, shall we handle things if uh, Miriam seems to be stuck and having difficulty connecting? <clears throat> well, I think we could. Shall we just open up the floor to discussion? I think, and then if she comes in, we can use the 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 four to four thirty slot for it. I don't think we should probably. Um... Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think Jim has a has a comment or a question. Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask Philip if you could. Uh, I'll send you an email asking for your slides, but can you share a link to your article from a couple of days ago? Uh, oh, we could. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd be happy to share links to any of those articles, but of course, to provide my slides as well. I, I'll, I'll send them across. Okay. Well, I'll put them up on our wiki page for in the interesting articles section. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a question which has haunted me for a while. So I'm Fred Adler at the University of Utah, and it's really about this separation of science and policy. And I, I do try to separate these two things in my own life for, for a variety of reasons, one of which, for example, is in teaching, is I don't want to have a particular policy objective that I'm pushing on students who I'm also grading. Um, but I do think there is a clean distinction between those. And my approach has been science presents us with scenarios with various levels of support and policy chooses among them. Do you agree with that separation and what role should scientists have in crossing that boundary? Well, I, I, in principle, I can see how that, I mean, that, that is often the sort of model that's talked about. Um, and certainly within science policy uh, advice in the UK, that has been the model. So, you know, there have been, um, science, there is always a chief scientific advisor. Um, and uh, for a situation like this, there's a, 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 an emergency group. It's the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, SAGE, that is convened. It's a very ad hoc group. Uh, that brings in all kinds of experts and they discuss, you know, what is happening and feed in advice to government. Um, and, you know, th that it, it seems, certainly in the past, that process has worked well. Um, I feel something went wrong in this case uh, because, you know, until um, uh, a, 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 a too late sta a stage in the advance of the pandemic in the UK. So until mid-March of last year, the idea was that we would pursue this herd immunity strategy. Um, so, you know, the idea was uh, there's no way we can stop the spread of the virus. It's inevitable. The only thing we get, the only way we're going to get out of this is by achieving herd immunity through natural infection because we can't count on virus on uh, vaccines coming in time. So the question is, you know, how are we going to avoid this? Uh, how are we going to how are we going to minimize deaths? And uh, so there were various sort of strategies, you know, drawn up. It was a, so they called it a mitigation strategy, and then they realized, which seemed frankly obvious to everyone who <laughs> was paying attention to the mortality rates of this virus, this was going to result in hundreds of thousands of people dying. And so, you know, suddenly they had to think, oh, my God, we can't have, I mean, a quarter of a million people, you know, was the likely figure. This was never going to be acceptable. And so suddenly at too late a stage, they switched to we're going to have to lock down. Um, something went wrong there and something went wrong in a, with a government that, you know, clearly has now, and we knew it at the time, has, was dysfunctional, that had a sort of dysfunctional leadership. But the fact that the policy that came out 
was one that fitted bizarrely well with the inclinations of the government, with a libertarian government who didn't like, you know, the, the, the state intervening, who, who, that, that took this uh, very sort of British view of, and this was literally the prime minister's words at one point, we've got to take it on the chin, you know, in, with the blitz spirit. This is the kind of government we have, this nationalistic government. I can't help thinking that something went on by which the scientific advisory process sort of somehow was drawn in line with what the government wanted to do. There wasn't this independence. And for some reason, things went terribly wrong. And I think, you know, what has unfolded since then um, is that there are all sorts of uh, examples of blunders where the, the, the scientists have wanted to sort of step back and say, well, that's a political issue, we won't get involved. Whereas in fact, it's a public health issue and they absolutely need to be involved. I think that's what I mean when I, I, I say it's exposed that that separation, the idea that you can be a government scientific advisor and not be by your very nature in that position, political, you know, I think is a fantasy. You've got to recognize that. Of course, you want to try to give objective information, but p particularly when you have a government like we have that won't necessarily want to hear or act on that information, what are you going to do then? Do you just accept that, okay, I'm the, the advisor, they make policy, all I can do is advise, or are you going to think, if they don't do this, tens or maybe hundreds of thousands of people are going to die unnecessarily? You know, that, that I think is the, the reality of the situation that not just the UK has faced. So I think that, you know, although ideally uh, you want a situation where the scientists can objectively advise, I think in reality, and particularly in, in a, a situation as enormous as this, I think it's inevitable that scientific advisors to government are going to find they're in a political position. They're going to be having to make to make statements that have political ramifications. And if they don't make them, they're not doing their job. So Philip, John Rice, um, did, did you actually end up interviewing scientists for your writing and stuff, person to person? I mean, if we had face to face, <laughs> it would have been, but. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. Throughout. I mean, in fact, you know, weirdly, John, the, the thing that's happened because, it's, because, you know, we're all doing that. We're all on Zoom. We're all in our homes. It's yeah. actually been easier <laughs> to do that, you know, over the past year than it ever has been. So, so there was something I read and I saved it. And unfortunately I saved so many things early on for history that now I can't find them. But, but a, a scientist was quoted as having said, you know, he was, he was being interviewed, um, answering questions for the media and, and paraphrasing very loosely. Um, but I realized that what I was saying may actually directly affect people's lives. And as a researcher, I'm not used to being responsible for that. And, and so the question kind of that I've always wanted to ask a media person is, or a, a writer is, did, how often did that come across from the scientists that they realize that, that in normal research, you discover things, you publish things, they get torn apart, they survive or they don't survive. And, and you have a career that goes like that. And that science is just not used to having to give an answer to a question on which somebody is going to take, could take immediate action that could have good or really bad, bad consequences. And then put that against the, the notion that no answer is never an acceptable answer to a decision maker. That, that when I'm seeking advice uh, to make a decision, if you don't give me any answer at all, that's not acceptable. And so now you're in a position of, you got to give the best answer you can. 
and the discovery that this could get damn serious. Yeah, I, I well, I, I think uh, so many scientists, particularly epidemiologists, but you know, plenty of others too, have been in a, 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 the, a sort of position over the past year that I, I can't imagine being, I can't imagine how it feels to think if I foul up on this modeling study, for example, and I get, you know, the numbers are wrong, um, it could lead to, literally, it could lead to mm. thousands of deaths. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that I've, for that reason, I think um, it's so important that we are, that, that, that we're not trying to find, certainly not trying to find scientific scapegoats when things go wrong. You know, I said that I think that this, uh, this initial policy, this initial strategy that emerged in the UK, I think it was disastrous. And in retrospect, and frankly, I have to say, even at the time, it seemed to me crazy. It seemed to be insane. Um, but, you know, I felt, well, these are the experts, you know, they must know what they're doing. But I think it's really important that uh, we don't somehow point the finger at them because, you know, this was such an unprecedented situation. Um, and uh, the fact is that, the, the, you know, they were having to th bring together models on, on the fly within, you know, overnight, literally, um, rather than having weeks and months to work it out with uncertain data. And in fact, you know, in the UK yeah. and I think in the US as well, almost no data to go on. The data was appalling that they had to go on. You know, we didn't even know, you know, what the mortality rate of, for, for the virus was. Um, so they were in an incredibly difficult position. Um, so I think we've absolutely got to understand that. And if some people got, you know, modeling wrong as a result of that, that science is normal. I think that's one of the things I feel, you know, is my job as, as a science communicator. When things have gone wrong, um, and, you know, if the vaccines had turned out to be worse than they were, I mean, it's fantastic that they're not. But if they had, you know, again, I feel like it would have been so important to say, look, this, you know, this is what happens normally in science. It's awful that it, we, we happen to be in a situation where the consequences of that are so huge. Uh, but the consequences of everything at, at the moment, you know, are so huge. So, so uh, I do think that's important. Um, but I also think that it's really important that in, if that happens, the scientists are still able, and it's a very difficult thing to do, I can see, but they're still able to go back and think, you know, to say, actually, I got that wrong. Um, and I'm starting to suspect there will be some who will be reluctant to do that. So one more quick one. When you have um, processed the lessons that you've observed and learned in the last year and a half, could you, could you do a workshop for a group of scientists where the topic of the workshop is, we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you things about trying to be a science writer that if you knew, you could be a much better communicator to the science writers. Are there some things that you could teach scientists about how writing gets done, uh, what motivates journalism, and and there's I think probably a big difference between the independent and the and the uh, formal media hired paycheck guys and gals. Are there lessons you could teach us if we asked you to do that? <laughs> I'd be happy to try. I I, I mean <laughs> I have occasionally done this. Um, yeah, you know I I I mean I think you know I think there are I think there are certainly <laughs> lessons. That, that can be learned about how to communicate effectively. I mean, those are lessons that I've had to try to learn and I'm still trying to learn. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'd be very happy to do that. I mean, I think, for example, I mentioned, you know, one thing it's not going to uh, be sufficient for us to do and perhaps for scientists to do is to say, look, you know, the chances of uh, the, the risk of this side effect, you know, there's 0.06% for God's sake. You know, the fact is, if you're telling someone go and have this thing injected in you, but there is any chance that you might die from it, um, you know, that's what's going to be in, in their mind. And so we have to find a different way of tapping into their intuitions. Uh, you know, about, I mean, this is an old, obviously an old uh, problem about how we process. I, process. I apologize, but uh, our second speaker
has heroically been able to connect after connection difficulties. And uh, uh, Miriam, are, are you, would you like to present? We, are you ready yes. to connect? Okay, I apologize. Thank you very much for, for making this effort. And then we'll resume. I, there are many questions I know for Phil. Uh, we'll resume the conversation uh, after Miriam's talk. Um, that was, that was uh, go ahead. Actually, that was fascinating. I was just about to invite my grandson so he can hear that. It's very important communicating having, science. Please have him come back at, at uh, four o'clock, and and, uh, and he's your grandson is most welcome to join in our conversation. So I'll turn it over to you, and I guess I guess I have to ask you to try to keep it extra short since we're we're a little short on time here. I will. I'll go very fast. I apologize for all the the snafus. No problem. No problem. Um, let me share screen. Hi, you can, um, I'll, I'll speak to you a little bit about one of the projects that we're doing where we work very closely with theorists and uh, the people that we are working with um, are from the Applied Mathematics Department at Stony Brook, Yu Fen Dong and Pong Zhang. Um, and they, they do a lot of modeling of uh, protein structure. So the goal is to see whether they can achieve a good model of spike protein so that we can have some predictability. But um, what I'll describe today is the experiment that we do where we use materials to affect protein folding that then has important consequences. Um, sort of, I, I like what Philip just said, is, you know, if I do something, does anybody, is it really gonna matter? And what I'm gonna talk about today is we're actually trying to persuade the physician which is Richard Clark up here. Uh, he's in phase one. He's just finished phase one trials of a peptide. And uh, he was using it for something else, which I'll talk about soon. But we're trying to persuade him that it's really, really important that he apply this now to people who've had COVID. So it's again, it's a collaboration where we get our viruses from Stefan Miller. He's from Cotagenics. Cotagenics is a company that actually makes vaccine. Uh, and they're going now with who? Uh, who's going to do their phase three trials of the COVID vaccine. And uh, at Stony Brook, uh, we work a lot with, with students of all ages, including high school students. You have a whole group of high school students who have really participated in a very effective way. Because again, in terms of communicating science, we feel that the kids really have their, their finger on the pulse of what science should be. They just don't have the tools to execute it. And that's where the collaboration comes in. We've got the tools, we can teach them the tools, but sometimes their ideas are just where we want to go. So um, I hope I have enough bandwidth here to do this. Okay, so the, the background here is that if you have viral infection of any kind, the Ebola, influenza, which we'll talk about, and the, this data is a little bit old, but we have much more current data. Even the adenovirus, this whole thing that's going on now with the J&J &J virus and with the Moderna, uh, sorry, with the AstraZeneca virus, which is different than the Moderna and the Pfizer. Anytime you have a viral infection, um, you have the virus infects a cell. The cell reacts by putting out hundreds, what you're seeing here is a recent paper in Nature, where they looked at 1,500 genes that were upregulated. That's what you're seeing here. As soon as the virus infects and for the next days till the cell dies, it's constantly playing with the cell genetic machinery. And uh, the first upregulation really starts to come in half an hour after infection, not very long. And half an hour is not really even enough for the virus to have come in 
and to have started to generate viral proteins and take over the cell machinery. That's just the cell response, uh, the inflammatory response of the cell. And you can sort of see here what happens, the virus infects, these are the different steps. It infects and then the virus gets taken into the cell and then it's, it takes over, it's inside these vesicles, it takes over the cell machinery and it starts to make its own proteins. We are at this stage up here very early when it just touches the membrane, as I'll show. And something happens at that stage. Oh, bandwidth problem. Okay, what happens is uh, you start to have, everything you see here is cell signaling. So the cells in H1N1, which is the one we studied because we can work with it in the lab versus SARS, which you have to have a, a BSL-3 enclosure, which is very tight, but they both do very, very similar things. Uh, they, they're able, they put together a huge uh, inflammatory response that nobody really understands. And even though tons has been written about it, like they say, the detailed mechanism of how coagulation contributes to the pathogenesis of influenza is still unknown. So the common thing between all these viruses is that they are basically clotting diseases. Um, COVID produces microthrombi in the lungs. So does H1N1. You don't hear about it that much because its infectivity is a lot lower, orders of magnitude lower. But for people who are infected, and there are senior people and young children in that case as well, who do die from the flu, uh, and this was the epidemic of 1918, it was because it produced thrombosis. So the question is, what is the origin? So now I'll take back a little bit one step at the clinical aspects. In the case of COVID, because there are so many people, this is a picture that we got of a thrombi that was taken out of a patient by the a vascular surgeon at Stony Brook, Mohsen Benazade. This is a very unusual clot. It's, it's this is just the entire vein. It's like you were bitten by a snake and your blood turned to jelly right here. That's one large clot. This is not the kind that like sort of breaks off and can end up in your brain or somewhere else. That's not going anywhere. On the other hand, your leg will become necrotic. So the question is why, why does that start? I mean, you can you know, shake your hands and say, yes, it comes with COVID. But if we understand the basic science behind it, then maybe we can do something to prevent it. So uh, what you're seeing here is uh, these are microthrombi, these are uh, mic microscopy images of cells. And the, those are red blood cells and where the arrows are pointing is this is where a thrombus has begun to form. And this is with SARS, and you see exactly the same thing beginning to form with H1N1. Now, when you're looking out of the box, completely out of the box, uh, a physician at Stony Brook by the name of Richard Clark showed almost identical looking pictures of cells right here. These were dermal cells that had undergone a burn. He has a burn study. And you say, what does burns have to do with COVID? Well, what they do have to do with COVID is that if you get a second degree burn, it'll progress to a third degree burn, even if the flame is gone, there's no flame. So the question was why? And microscopically, what happens is that you make microthrombi inside all the little blood vessels that produces necrosis. It's the same kind of thing that you have in your lungs with COVID. And, um, he came up with this peptide called P12, which when it's added immediately after the burn, P12 comes immediately after the burn, you still see he stains there for fibrinogen. There's still adsorption of fibrinogen to the blood vessel, to the vessel, but clots don't form. The vessel remains clear, blood can flow, and you can heal. So he is, he's got a $10 million NIH, $10 million NIH and DOD grant for developing of P12 as a therapy for burns and he's finished stage one. So how are the two connected? Here comes the theory. This is a fibrinogen molecule. Fibrinogen molecule has a bunch of chains and they have these alpha C chains 
uh, that are tethered here. That's a good thing because your blood contains a lot of fibrinogen. That's the major protein of your blood. And as long as that chain stays tethered, it will flow and it won't clot. When you get hurt, a wound, there's a cascade that happens where, where you have enzymes that cleave right here, little tiny region. And when they cleave, the enzymes cleave down here. And when they cleave, the alpha C domains open up and they start to make fibers. Why do they start to make fibers? Because they have domains at the very end of the alpha C that picks up other fibers and pretty soon they polymerize into giant fibrin fibers. That's your blood clot. Okay, the problem comes in, why do you get blood clots when they stick a piece of plastic like a stent or a valve in your heart? Why must you be on blood thinners? Where do the clots come from? So this was a study that we had done a number of years ago with Dennis Galanakis. If you take a hydrophobic surface versus a hydrophilic surface, and you expose the fibrin monomer to it, the fibrin monomer has, these are three different regions and these are the alpha C's. They've been shortened here, they're actually very long. The inside is very hydrophobic. So the enthalpic interaction is so strong that it shifts the molecule, it distorts it enough to actually break the bond of the alpha C domain as if it's been cleaved by enzyme. Similarly, if you put it on a hydrophilic surface, this molecule flips upside down where it exposes the hydrophobic end while the hydrophilic end is adsorbed to the surface. You can see the difference in structure between the two molecules. What's the consequence of this? The consequence is that if you put this in the bloodstream, you can see here, um, we, we, uh, if you take a look at the leftmost one here, if you put it in the bloodstream, it accumulates more fibers and pretty soon, hold on. Sorry, the, the uh, okay. My uh, bandwidth is funny. Okay, what happens when you open it up, we'll just leave it statically here. When the molecule is opened up, it collects from the bloodstream something known as, right here, soluble fibrin. Soluble fibrin is small fibrin fibers that we all have in our bodies. Every time you do get hurt and this thrombin is involved in making a blood clot. There are sections on the fibrinogen molecule that kill the thrombin so that it stops clotting. But it's not a perfect reaction, it's imperfect. And there's a little bit left over, not enough to make a full-fledged clot, but enough to make something called soluble fibrin, which is a fibrin doublet that goes around in your bloodstream, but it's still hydrophilic because it has uh, the alpha C domains protecting it on the outside. This soluble fibrin, by the way, FYI, is a very important parameter, which unfortunately, unfortunately they don't really measure with COVID. People that have high soluble fibrin fraction are people that have had, for example, blood transfusions, that have undergone dialysis. Anytime you, you uh, activate platelets, you're going to get soluble fibrin. The more soluble fibrin you have, the higher your propensity to clot. It's well known that people who have dialysis are at a clot risk because of the soluble fibrin. Men will have more than women, old people more than young people. It really follows a little bit about your uh, outcome, adverse outcome of COVID. But you have this soluble fibrin. Now this soluble fibrin is critical for making, for inducing fibers in, uh, at a surface here. So what happens when the molecule opens up, it picks up the soluble fibrin from your blood and it starts to generate these very big fibers that are anchored to the surface. These fibers uh, on the hydrophobic surfaces, on the hydrophilic surface where the alpha C is bound, nothing happens. This is immunohistochemical staining where we can actually see the formation and what the molecule looks like. 
And you can only see fibers on polymers that are hydrophobic. P4VP is hydrophilic, sort of proving this model. Now, let me go fast. Here we have, this was done at the FDA, where we actually flow blood across it. When we're flowing blood, you can see the beginning of the platelet clots forming here on these fibers. On the P4VP, you've got exposed a different domain, and here you have red blood cell clots, here you have platelet clots. What this picture tells you is the way the protein is folded is the way that the blood will clot. By turning the surface, hydrophobicity or the enthalpy, you've got a knob now to determine whether you're clot or not on the surface. So I now, for breaking in after all your heroic effort, but we have five minutes. Yep, I'll be done. I'm coming to the end. Uh, you can see those are the large clots. Okay, now here's the theory the P12, we modeled where does the P12 go? The P12 anchors itself at the end of the molecule. The P12 is at the region where it, it accumulates, collects the soluble fibrin. So the addition of P12 prevents microthrombi from forming. And that's why it prevents uh, the, what happens in a burn. But what happens with, P, with uh, now with COVID? We did the similar kind of experiment where we infected cells with H1N1. Also, we infected cells with SARS-CoV-43, which is not as infectious. And what we find is the very similar blood clots are forming right now because of some, one of the inflammatory agents. You're infecting the epithelial cell. It produces a, an inflammatory molecule that then adsorbs on the endothelium surface, changing it to, we don't know if it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic, but it changes the enthalpic interaction with fibrin producing these clots. When you add P12 that prevents the clots from forming, you have no fibers. Also, when you remove the soluble fibrin fraction, uh, such as here, soluble fibrin fraction is removed, you again, you have no clots. Going back to the model that we proposed for preventing the clotting formation in, uh, due to COVID. Recently, we also added the adenovirus. We did exactly the same screen where we infect epithelial cells, bring over the media that has the, this factor, and we observe the same kind of beginning of clots with adenovirus as well. So in conclusion, virus infection can initiate non-thrombogenic uh, fibrinogen clots on the surfaces. And they do that by modifying the enthalpic interaction between the blood and the surface. And the big question from a uh, fundamental point is why and where is the interaction? That's what we're looking at by modeling. And from a clinical point of view, we really would like, the doctors don't have to wait for us to come up with a model. We really would like for this to go to stage three so people can, this will be life-saving if it happens. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely talk, and I appreciate your racing in a very complex problem. I know there were a group of people at IU School of Medicine in Notre Dame who did some nice model of clot and initiation information, multi-scale modeling, Mark Alber and his colleagues. Oh. Um, and so okay. that was oh, some, that... some years ago, but they, they've done some beautiful work on that topic. Mark Alpert, I'd love to contact Albert, him. Mark Alpert, he's now at UC Riverside. Okay, okay. Uh, and he's also done some experiments on the topic. Mark, Mark is still Albert. working on, in that field. Okay, this is something very unusual. People don't, have not related the surface protein interaction to the initiation of clots. They know that it happens. And uh, for example, when you have a stand put in, the stents are loaded with uh, cytotoxic factors to prevent uh, the adsorption of platelets to the clot, but they don't explain why the clot forms. If you stop the clot from the beginning, then you don't need all that. And uh, it, it could be done 
by proper modification of the surface. And, and that's what we're trying to model with the group of five men. Of course, you mentioned adenoviruses, so, uh, and Philip had been talking about vaccine, uh, vaccine uh, uh, side effects earlier. So, of course, of course it's uh, definitely on everyone's mind, and uh, uh, so we it's, appreciate that. The, the, it's the delivery system that's doing yes. it, not the vaccine. And probably we didn't have enough careful reporting for previous, probably the current vaccines have been monitored more carefully. And so they're picking up things that were occurring before with other adenovirus vector vaccines. The, so, the, go ahead. So go ahead the, the rates are so low that you really needed a pandemic to see it. Fascinating. So- I mean, we're doing this in a test tube where we're loading with this stuff. You would die if your blood looked like this. I, I, I'm always pleased because I, I don't do them anymore. I used to do a lot of HUVEC experiments in my own lab. So it's uh, nice oh. to see HUVEC culture. Um, so how shall we go forward? Um, do people want to, they're very different topics. Do people want to split up into groups? Uh, it, can I have a show of hands if, of how many people would like to talk directly to Miriam? That might be the most efficient way to do it. If there's a if there's a large contingent who would like to to, be, uh, to talk to her uh, one on one, I can I've got the breakout room set up. And other if if not, we'll stay in the main room. Does anybody does anybody have specific questions we could ask? If there are one or two questions, it's fine. But if, otherwise, we'll op usually we'd open the floor to general discussion now. So. Uh, on the other hand, if they're going to be questions specifically about clotting, uh, that might or might not be a good match to discussion of uh, the, 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 the scientific issues of COVID and the political issues of COVID. I'm not seeing a strong, strong groundswell either way here. I, I, I'm interested in the political discussion too, so let's keep okay. it together. Okay, then, uh, then I will do that. Uh, 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 then it, the floor is open to questions. Richera, you've been exceedingly patient. Please go ahead. Yeah, so I had questions actually for both speakers. So it, I guess it's good that, that, um, that the floor is open. So should I present them just both at once or, or is there some order to them? Uh, it's it's an open discussion any way you like is fine. Okay, I guess I'll I'll ask um, Miriam first because maybe if it's more specific, then it may be sh a shorter answer. So the question is that uh, so the the regulation of clotting versus thinning it's really tightly regulated because it's you know it, there's there can be uh disastrous consequences either way if it's not if it's not at the right factor it has to be just so so it seems like there must be some reason for the or i don't know if reason is the right word but there must be some some precipitating cause for uh for what is seen like for instance maybe it's maybe it's for preventing something else like biofilm formation or it's it's adapted to some other situation are, and so that's one part of the question and the other part is are there uh, do you know of any like cytokines that are associated with these changes that you see um, that that also might come up in some other context um, there's there's a two parts to this question when these um, blood, that's part, that was part of the problem with COVID. Blood thinners do help somewhat, but not that much. People will be bleeding, uh, not clotting properly because of the blood thinner, and yet have thrombiformic. The non-thrombogenic clot is very different than the thrombogenic clot. It uh, it will it will adsorb and and pull down 
any fibrinogen that's in the blood. Thinning, if it decreases the concentration, will help, but not that much. So um, it's still there. It, it's a phenomena that really has to be stopped and blood thinners don't completely help. That's number one. But you're right, there's a question of when you add P12, you have to be able to dose it properly. Otherwise it can have, it could be toxic in itself. Um, sort of, you know, prevent blood from clotting altogether. So that would be bad. Um, that's number one. Um, the, well, what was the, the second part? Oh, I forgot, <laughs> I was lost track. The, uh, the second- uh, or is there is there some signaling yes, yes, that, that yes, changes? Yes. Yes. Okay. So here's the mystery that you, you, you really hit upon a huge debate going on now in the literature. At first, uh, it was thought that the virus infects the endothelium directly. But now there's a, a whole bunch of literature, especially somebody called Eric Macow at Stony Brook and others, who uh, claim that there are no ACE receptors on endothelium. Therefore, the virus very difficult to infect the endothelium directly. The virus infects the epithelium, and then there has to be some kind of soluble factor which then damages the endothelium. That's the current lore right now. But uh, there are many, many genes that are upregulated on viral infection producing hundreds of cytokines. So we're trying to do that, that's where the Sherlock Holmes detective work is coming in. So all we know right now is that whatever of these cytokine factors is it's stable. You can kill the virus by heating your uh, heating at above 60 degrees and it's not gonna kill this molecule. Um, and it is definitely in the solution, but not much is known right now as to what it is. Thank you. <laughs> So should I ask my question to to Philip Ball or, or should, are we waiting for Please go ahead with sure. No, go ahead. Yes. yes. So, so the question was you you mentioned a sort of failure that happened in terms of scientific advice from the people who were tasked with that with advising government. And you noted that there was some curious alignment between what was being advised and the political uh, desiderata of the government that was at hand. So that is always a danger. And this is one reason why many scientists prefer to stay entirely aloof so that they don't get drawn into politicization. So you pointed out that that itself was dangerous because you know then then this is there's this thing that can happen. So it seems like there, th what you're saying is that there should be some division of labor and there should be some some set of scientists who are outside of government and yet who whose function is to comment and critique from an outside and distant perspective on directly on policy. So would you? So it seems like it's possible that there was some bystander effect that maybe many scientists think that you know, in principle, such a thing should happen, but nobody thinks that I'm, I'm supposed to do it. And it isn't actually, it isn't actually necessarily productive if everybody suddenly starts doing that. So would, what would you say is who should be tasked with that kind of a function? Would it be science communicators like yourself? Uh, would it there be like a separate, you know, would it just be whoever feels like taking it upon themselves? How, how would you suggest that such a dis division of labor uh, would ideally happen if, if you had your druthers? Uh, well, Richera, I think the, the honest answer is um, I, I, at this stage, I don't have any proposal for how things could be made better because I don't think we understand well enough what went wrong. I, what I've called for, what I've called for in the newspapers is for scientific organizations in the UK, like the Royal Society, the um, British Medical Association, to gather together to have a scientific inquiry 
into the pandemic? How did the science play out? You know, how, how good was the scientific advice when it went wrong? Why did it go wrong? And also to look at the things that really, you know, there are some things that went fantastically. The, um, the, the uh, genomic uh, analysis of virus variants uh, that's going on in the UK is, you know, fantastic and has been so useful. So there's plenty to celebrate too, but I think that, that there needs to be some understanding of what went wrong, what went right, why was that so? Are there ways that we can improve this? I think that in the past, um, for example, in the, the foot and mouth epidemic that happened um, uh, virtually 20 years ago now, you know, much the same mechanism uh, was in place and it went pretty well. And the scientific advice, you know, was good. And I think the, the, uh, the situation was well handled. So it's not obvious that there's something terribly astray here. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm simply struck by the fact that what we ended up with was a, pot, was a strategy, a bad strategy that aligned very well with the inclinations of the, the sort of libertarian government that we had. And I think, you know, quite possibly the problem was that when scientists were giving objective advice, perhaps there was some mechanism by which the, the, the politicians were saying, well, I like the sound of that. Let's go for that. Will that work? Uh, I don't know what it was. I mean, you know, the, the, this uh, guy, the, uh, the government advisor, Dominic Cummings, yesterday was saying there was groupthink involved. And I think that's probably true. It certainly seemed to be true within the scientific advisory group um, that everybody thought there's only one way out of this. We've got to have herd immunity. And, you know, the only question is how we get there, um, whereas clearly that's not happened and it wasn't the only way out. So that, those are the sorts of questions that we need to, to, to ask, whether there are ways of improving that process. I don't know. What, what I would say is that the, the scientists who've been involved have been involved at all sorts of levels. So the chief scientists are, you know, they're, they're, they become civil servants. They're our, their bosses are the politicians. Um, so, you know, that, that, that in a sense, their role has changed and their duties have changed in some sense from, from what they did before. But th this, this group, SAGE, that provided the advice, there's all kinds of people there who are more or less loosely affiliated and are brought in when their expertise is needed and have no particular political obligations at all and have, you know, can and have spoken out against uh, what the uh, government policies have been when they when they felt it was necessary in a way that the top scientists weren't really able to do as civil servants you know they're meant to be supporting the government so uh, you know there, there there are a whole there was a whole range of different levels of involvement of scientists here and i don't think there are easy sort of divisions amongst that uh, but but what I do feel I didn't see was enough recognition that if you are operating at the high, at a high level, you know, um, uh, 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 in terms of giving feeding advice into government, then you are part of the political process. You have to abandon the notion that you're an objective observer, simply giving uh, you know uh, uh, objective advice uh, to government because it's not gonna work that way. And it's certainly not going to work that way when the politicians who are receiving it have very strong you know, political agendas that are going to influence their decision-making in a, a, a situation like this one. So that I, th sorry, that doesn't really answer your question, but, but except to say that I think those are the questions we need to have addressed, that we need to be asking through a proper scientific inquiry separate from the general public inquiry that we are told at some stage is going to happen here. So by a scientific inquiry, in this case, you include a social scientific inquiry, uh, inquiry in, in, including the sociology of science itself? Uh, well, including the sociology of science itself, certainly including the social sciences, you know, we, we want to understand, I mean, that has been such a, a huge and again, neglected part of what's going on here, the behavioural aspects of, uh, of formulating a policy have been amongst the most complicated ones, and there too. There, there, something went desperately wrong. You know, the behavioural advice that our government seemed to have heard, at least, was you can't do a lockdown in the UK. You can do it in East Asia because they're used to those things and they do what their governments tell them to do. But the British people won't accept that. This awful, awful exceptionalism 
that happened and that was that has literally been uh, fatal. So, you know, I think that questions need to be asked there as well. But absolutely, the questions about the sociology of science in terms of, um, you know, whether there was groupthink, whether it turned out that the scientists were, you know, just a bit sort of frightened of contradicting uh, politicians in the end. You know, when things went so bad, so badly wrong in the second wave and the government was so obviously ignoring scientific advice, some of the scientists did start speaking out. But I think they needed to have done that sooner. But it's very hard for them to do that. You know, as I say, if their role is political and is part of the civil service. So I think that would also need to be the sorts of questions that a scientific inquiry you know, needed to ask, is it right that the chief scientific advisors have these or feel these obligations to the politicians that will compromise what they can say to them? Right. So then there's the question of incentive compatibility, like to what extent there's their their uh, their obligation to their advisors versus I, I'm sorry, their supervisors versus their obligations to the public. Yeah, well, so, you know, yeah. normally those you would hope that those two things are aligned because the the the, the you know the politicians the policymakers are going to do the things that they are told are the best things to do in the interest of public health. But actually, in this situation, it was very clear that those two things weren't aligned. Sometimes that scientists needed to speak out for the sake of public health about the things that the government was or wasn't doing properly. Can, can I sort of make a small comment here? When, as scientists, everything comes with an error bar and a probability. So people were so desperate for looking for a remedy, like one, one size fits all, that when they, they came up with remdesivir or this or that, yes, maybe it helped 20%. And for those 20%, it was 100% effective. It was just the other 80%. So when someone later on, when someone would use it and it didn't help them, oh, this is terrible, they're lying. They're not lying. They're making a statement within a p-value. And that didn't get communicated. Yeah, the public yeah. understanding of basic probability, I mean, I don't know about the UK, but in the US, uh, it's it's not generally well understood. What, what, what think, is probability? I think John, John Rice had a good point. And this was very clear in, in, the, in, in the, the, those Caltech uh, phone calls uh, back in March, April, May of last year, which is that, especially epidemiology said, there were not enough data to predict what was going to happen. You could not extrapolate effectively from the amount of data that were available in January, February, March to predict the outcome of the epidemic. You knew it was going to be bad, but you, you, your error bars were times 10, times 50 divided by 50. You had fundamentally no information. And yet governments had to make decisions about how they were going to act. And they wanted to, in the absence of information. And if the disease had been handled properly, in so quotation marks, successfully, the way SARS was, people would have said that they were lockdowns and precautions for nothing. And so there is a, is a bit of a problem, which is that if, if, this, if, this, if this pandemic had been prevented, people would blame the scientists for having overreacted. And, and, and also there were decisions that had to be made before information was available. Now one could work with analogy, one could work, but, but, but the scientific uncertainties were enormous at the beginning. Well, I, I think I think this is this has been this was one of the problems with the British um, approach because you know you had all these models and you had all these curves saying well if we do this much mitigation the curve will look like this, um, uh, you know on the, on the basis of insufficient information we we somehow convinced ourselves that we could model our way out of this crisis with models that were unconstrained as you say by data. So, you know, we need to understand, and, and there have, have been people saying here, modeling led the strategy too much. Um, I think that may well be true, but certainly there was this notion that, you know, somehow because you have these models and they look nice and they can produce these curves, um, that somehow they're going to guide you out. Whereas, it, you know, it seemed 
clear to me at the time and even more clear to me now and plenty of other people are saying it that the, the, what you do with a lockdown it's not that you just are stopping everything and hoping the virus is going to go away you're stopping everything and getting better data getting more understanding get a, getting pre better preparation finding what antivirals might work buying yourself time so that if you have to face it you know three months down the line you do so far better equipped with with the data you need Uh, I Sorry, I have a question for Philip. Um, it was it was fascinating to listen to you in regard. Is there an echo? I can hear an echo. Okay. Um, it was fascinating to listen to you in regard to the different roles you think scientists and uh, science communicators play. And it reminds me um, of my time when I worked in the history of science. There were there were sort of two camps. One were the purists <clears throat> that, um, that would insist, you know, just the facts. And then there were other camps that said, well, if we do not provide interpretation, then we have no audience other than ourselves. But interpretation, of course, um, has, has dangers attached to it. And, um, and I think for science communicators, uh, the issue is the same. Uh, lay people <clears throat> you you are the only chance for them to to really understand science and uh, <clears throat> put it in context, uh, but that puts a, a tremendous burden on the science communicator. Well, how, how do you think about this? Mm. Uh, it does, and it. I guess I felt it. It has <laughs> required a very sort of delicate balance of humility, because you know, my God, we're we're experts at nothing, so we, and we have to recognize that. Um, uh, and a readiness to speak out when you when you feel it's it's necessary to do so, to not just stand back and think, well, you know, my job is simply to, to give the facts. Um, it's to give the context to that, you know, to those facts. So if those are facts coming from, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, the NIH, then you will give them more weight than facts coming from some, you know, uh, data analyst, uh, analyst in Silicon Valley, which was a real problem at the beginning. Um, doesn't mean to say that what you know, you, you decide one is right and one is wrong, but you know that's the kind of context you have to provide. Um, but it's it it isn't an easy one um, because you know if you're giving an interpretation, then we too. Ha, that you know that there may be sort of lives in the balance there um it's certainly been the case that in the media that have decided to you know want to sort of undermine the uh, decisions that have been taken and suggest that actually sweden had it right and everything's fine in sweden why didn't we do it that way there's been a lot of that around um or you know why that i mean you know this you know better than i do at the moment you know why the hell are we still wearing masks um you know, then, you know, absolutely, you're going to be having effects on lives. Um, but, you know, I think that maybe that's a good a good example that I, I feel that it may be the science communicator's role to actually push back a bit on, you know, why is the CDC saying, OK, everyone, no need for masks anymore. Um, why do that? At this point, what is the what, what what is the cost of just you know erring on the side of caution? Except that it's you know there's a lot of political pressure uh, to change that. So I think you know it, w w that sort of role for a science communicator just to sometimes to say you know let's think carefully about this advice, think where it's coming from, and you know what we've learned so far. Um, that's really what I mean to try to be a broker, not to say this is what we should do because you know, we're in, not in a position to do that, but just to try to contextualize what others are telling us to do. Mm, great, thank you. And I think other questions, comments. I know, in, I remember one of the talks in the Caltech series uh, was uh, uh, by a group that, that actually uh, published an epidemiological study that had an effect on the Israeli elections. Uh, so, so there was uh, sometimes politicization of the other directions. Well, a few times I think modeling has probably had a, an effect on an election. Uh, uh, 
because it 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 proposed that the getting out of lockdown would be easier than uh, had been thought otherwise, um, and that was played up by the uh, Israeli government at the time uh, very substantially. Of course, Israel has done a fantastic job on vaccination, so they've done an extremely good. But at that time, they didn't know there'd be vaccines. Uh, but it was quite interesting. It was a long discussion of that politicization back in April uh, of the last year, so a year ago. Quite quite interesting. I wanted to come to to a topic that you didn't address, which was maybe it's a sort of a separate question, which was the that something that 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 the the press has done, and I've seen it especially from the New York Times and and the Economist which has been in trying to aggregate quantitative data, especially epidemiological data, uh, to build reliable uh, data sets, or at least data sets with, with quantified uncertainties on, on infection and death rate where that would otherwise not be available. And it's the first time I've ever really noticed, maybe it happens all the time, where uh, the, the journalists, in quotation marks, were actually generating very important uh, scientific and public health data sets and making them available. And was that a new role or is that a role that's always been there that we just haven't been so aware of? No, I, I think that is a new role. And certainly I've not seen that, that happen before. Um, uh, and I, you know, I, and I think it's a, it's a fantastic role. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've certainly seen um, you know some instances uh, here in the UK in uh, in British media that where data has been generated that's been really useful to the discussion. The Financial Times did, I, I think they're they're not alone in this. Did analysis of, you know, the the effects, the economic effects versus the the health effects of of lockdowns and you know blowing apart this idea, which I think was always you know shaky, that you somehow trade the one off against the other. And showing that you know actually the countries that have you know that that, that locked down hardest did best in terms of both economics and public health. There was never that trade-off. So that that sort of exercise, I think, has been um, has been really valuable. Um, yeah, I think the media has a big role, potential role to play as a you know collator of, uh, of 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 data that you won't necessarily find, or at least in an accessible form, anywhere else. Um, th there was a, an interesting, you know, one of these viral videos that was going around the internet, and it was um, it was Bush, George Bush, um, going, "We've got to fight the the SAR the the SARS cov I guess it was one at that time. We have to fight this. We have to put every effort of the NIH into this because it's not a matter of individuals. It's a matter of national security." Our Navy will get sick. Our Army will get sick. We're putting ourselves at risk. So he, he at that time, I guess, that put the first billion dollars into developing a vaccine against SARS in 05. And after it was contained within a couple of years, it just died and nobody cared anymore. And that was the end of that. Well, this, but it's, yeah. it's far reaching. The effects are, are really security. It's a matter of security when you have that. I think, well, I, you know, it, it feels like this comes back to the, the, the point that James raised about, you know, the, the, the fear that you're going to be seen to have overreacted. You know, some people clearly said at the beginning and rightly said, that's that's the outcome you want. You want people saying, oh, we overreacted to that. Um, but it's a very difficult one. And in fact, you know, that was an absolutely salient point for the UK government. That was, as we learned yesterday, the main fear of the prime minister was that we were going to be seen to have overreacted and, you know, done, taken unnecessary precautions. And here's someone who hates the idea that you take precautions and that you live carefully. Um, so, you know, that was driving, you know, I think that was driving the response that we, we, you know, a lockdown would have been seen as an overreaction because it might turn out that we didn't quite need to do it as soon or as hard as we did. Um, so, you know, I think that 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 really is going to be a problem because you're absolutely going to have people saying, you know, if, if that had happened, uh, as you know, it might have done for SARS or for MERS, um, you're absolutely going to have people saying, well, that was, you know, we needn't have done, we shouldn't have done that, should we? What a waste of money that was. I hope we've learned that lesson. I hope that is at least one lesson that we've learned that, the, you know, 
that is what you aim for. You aim for <laughs> overreaction in a in a pandemic like this. I guess one thing, I mean, of course, Miriam's talk addressed a bunch of, of very salient issues, vaccine safety, uh, better treatments uh, for people at risk. Um, all, and, those, and as you pointed out, Miriam, those are not unique to SARS, CoV-2. They also apply to influenza and other, other viral infections. And, and one of the things that maybe one lesson from SARS one was that there was a lesson that we weren't as well prepared as we could have been, that people forget uh, that the kind of work that Miriam is talking about shows that there's a, a great deal of commonality in response to viral infection. Uh, and that maybe, maybe this time it's possible to not forget so quickly and be better prepared the next time. Do you have either, both of you, what, what could you think of perhaps uh, that are the lessons so that we could be better prepared for the next pandemic? Uh, both of maybe on the science very, and the policy sides. I have a very um, not optimistic view. I think you, you can already see it because now that, that, uh, sorry, that we, we've conquered it by the vaccine, the amount of funding, the interest is starting to really take a deep dive. And I suspect that all those wonderful efforts that had started now within two years will be gone. It's gonna be an orphan disease again and it's gonna go really slow till the next time. I, I think that's just the, that's how people are. I don't know, maybe I'm very pessimistic, but research activity is driven by where the funding is. And right now we had somebody from the NIH come to Stony Brook at the height of the pandemic. And this was disturbing. Uh, they had just given a lot of money to the vaccine people, which is fine. That was a very good idea. But that's also what made this thing go south because they were trying to get it before November 3rd. If you remember that, we're gonna have a vaccine before November 3rd. But there were also a lot of efforts going on at the time in trying to understand uh, what kind of sanitizers, prevention. And there was some lady who asked this person, we have a, a program that has prevention. We're still worried about other diseases. And the answer was, we don't have time for that right now. <laughs> and she couldn't get funded. So it, that kind of thing is what gives the impression that these things are political. It's not a balanced approach to a disease. Hey, Philip, Philip I, have a, I have a question about headlines, breaking news. Every, we had it, the, I mean, the industry of media journalism is if you can't get it into six words that fit in the breaking news banner, um, then the, the message is lost. You, you heard Miriam's presentation what, what would your headline be if you were to take what she was trying to say and, and turn that into a headline so that you could get a front page? And that's maybe a very unfair question because <laughs> you weren't prepared. But, but it's kind of a workshoppy kind of concept is, is how, do the, how do the media turn important things into a headline because that's how media works. Um, okay, well, I, whatever headline it would be, I think it would have to convey the idea that what we're learning about here is ultimately how the virus does its damage. Um, uh, you know, I think that's the key that if we if we can convey that we're learning about, you know, how, how does it cause this havoc in our lungs? Um, uh, the havoc that is related to, to clotting. Um, I think that's, you know, that that in the end, because because what that is saying is this is this is learning. This is 
get, giving us some information about why you might die. <laughs> Um, to put it bluntly, you know, that's what you have to do. I mean, you know, that's not going to be the headline, but that is the implication that, you know, that what, what, how is it going to affect you? Well, it might help to understand, you know, something, uh, w w why you might die and how to prevent you from dying from this virus. Um, so, you know, clearly you, you, you have to temper that in the right way that, you know, not cure for, uh, you know, cure for cure for covid but uh but 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 it has to convey that idea um, but, so you have to really burrow down to to, to that Yeah, you know, and in part i'm reacting to a paper i just saw this morning which i sent to a few people where where the headlines were things like nobel laureate says and and then if you read it yeah they got the nobel prize for science fiction or something 45 years ago that kind of headlining mentality, how much damage did that add? So, I mean, we're over the time and I'm willing to stay for a long time, talk to you guys, but, you know. I know, well, you, you, I mean, I'm sure, uh, you, John, you've heard the, the term clickbait and that's, you know, that's what uh, we're seeing so, so much that, you know, with headlines um, that, that, you know, so often the headlines are, are, are there not to tell you anything about the article, but to make you want to read it. Um, and, you know, that's, that's the problem we're up against. And by the way, because I think many, not just scientists, but readers generally don't realize this, we science writers almost never get to write our own headlines. Um, and that's a problem Ooh. because oh. I, you know, there have been publications that I still write for where I've never, hardly ever had a headline that I think actually reflects what it is that I wanted to say in the piece. And, you know, it's always a balance of how much of a fuss you kick up about that. But but sometimes it's necessary to kick up a fuss about that. And occasionally I've had to ask for a headline to be changed because I feel it's it's, you know, dangerously misleading. So that's part of the obligation I feel I have as a writer. That's why sometimes we have to go talk to the people who actually work in the field and do what you do. I mean, <laughs> you don't get to write your own headlines, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And, you know, I'd see many people saying, actually, you know, read the article. It doesn't reflect what's in the, the headline. You see, you know, that, that very often happens, sadly. Um, and I've had it happen to, to, to myself. So that is a problem. Um, I understand why it happens in newspapers, you know, headline writing is an art and, uh, you know, I'm not an ex, I'm not, I wouldn't claim that I was very good at it, but it can cause problems. Miriam, what would you like your headline to say? <laughs> <laughs> if you could pack what you have, if you could take what you have, that that made sense to me as a layman, not, you know, I mean, it just yeah. made sense <laughs> and put a headline on it to get people to pay attention. What should it say? Gosh. And I hope I'm not wasting people's time. I, I'll, I'll volunteer because she shouldn't speak. She didn't want to speak for herself because she didn't headline her own talk that way. New yeah. insight into the origin, thrombogenic origin of the viral complications and yeah. potential approaches to preventing it. That, right. would, be, that yeah. would be the headline. T yeah. Totally boring to a lay audience, but the truth. <laughs> well, I don't think it's boring to lay audience because people are terrified of, of AstraZeneca and other vaccines that use yeah. the, the data virus vector. Uh, and so clearly, even if the actual risk is very small, uh, as you pointed out earlier, the, the, the acceptable risk for, for vaccines is, is very, very small. During the pandemic, the acceptable risk is higher because the risk of death is higher. But as soon as, as you control the virus, then vaccines have one, of the, have one of the tightest safety tolerances of any kind of medical uh, treatment that's released. Mm -hmm. so, so understanding that uh, is really a very profound advance. I mean, what, what I would, as a writer, what I would ask you, Miriam, um, is, uh, you know, is what you have found out so far, could, could it help to prevent the, the side effects that we've seen? Is there, you know, some yes. 
some some manipulation that would that would uh, enable that to be avoided. Yes, so. definitely. Right. It, yeah, yeah. Then it, it would be one of those things that as soon as it, it's almost like uh, you know the the famous antibody treatment that Trump got, but as soon as someone becomes ill, uh, low doses of this P12 will prevent the thrombotic effect that follows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It won't cure it. It's not the equivalent of a vaccine at all. But once infected, it will can't prevent that. So there we are. Hope, new hope for you know, avoiding you know. vaccine side effects. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> OK, that's how you're the writer. <laughs> that's correct. I like that. That's very good. <laughs> Well, Philip, I would encourage you to join our working group. Just join us and visit our meetings on Thursday and learn new things. And then join the dissemination working group and help us learn how to do better. I, I, I'm very happy to, to join and I would try to, uh, to, to, to come along when I can. I, you know, couldn't couldn't put my hand on my heart and commit to being able, being able to do that regularly, but it'd be fantastic to do that sometimes because it's, um, I mean, you know, I've learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you. That, that was very nice because uh, we do a lot of work in nanoparticles. And uh, once I was on this panel and it was called uh, Genetic Engineering and Nanotechnology, A Brave New World. Never go on a panel with that title, <laughs> big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so this was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> well, are there any last questions from our audience? I mean, people have been quite quiet. Um, the usual suspects have been talking a lot. I'm glad there was a dialogue between Philip and Miriam. That was lovely. Um, I have so many. I mean, to me, there's so many morals from, from the COVID about the things we don't understand. We need to understand animal immune responses better, to understand why bat viruses seem to be pre-adapted to cause problems in humans. We need to understand human immune responses, and clearly immune uh, vascular responses better to be prepared for other viruses. Yeah. There are a lot of lessons on the scientific side and, and you, Philip, you, you addressed a lot of these social, the fact that you can't separate science and society uh, in a way that, that's quite profound. And I wish we, we could have you back to talk more about these issues. Yeah. Any one of your bullet points could be an hour <laughs> or two hour conversation, not a 15 minute one. I, I, things that like what Philip are doing are incredibly important. And I, I can't really overemphasize that because I come from Brookhaven National Lab. Brookhaven has one of the premier reactors in the country. 99% of the isotopes used in medicine today came from Brookhaven. It was shut down in an instant because of poor communication to the public. In an instant, people had this idea that you had, uh, they had this show, I forgot who it was, uh, where you had people with kids with deformities and the mothers were gone. When I visited the grandmother who lived downwind from Brookhaven lab and look what happened, okay? And the Brookhaven scientists said, oh, this is ridiculous. They just threw it out of hand, completely not realizing that these people vote for the politicians who give them the funding. Mm -hmm. And we were shut down for nothing. So it's critical to be able to communicate. The public is suspicious of scientists. They think we work in the back room somewhere and we don't care that the headline in our local paper was science at all costs. And, and that's how we're viewed, which is not a good way. So it's really important to build back the trust with the community. And you know what Philip just said right now is, is amazing. So I think it's really important. Well, well, thank you. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's true. good to, to hear that, 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 you know, that it's, that it's appreciated. Um, I mean, I guess I feel that uh, there are so many aspects of the way the public sees science that we have learned um, that have surprised me, actually, you know, in this pandemic. And it's a it's such a complex thing. It's such a, you know, the, the fact that things that seem straightforward scientific questions like masks or even like some antivirals have become political bombs. 
you know, mm-hmm. I've I've discovered that you you mentioned uh, remdesivir. I, I've met, uh, you know I've discovered that there's a kind of little cult around ivermectin. Uh, that <laughs> ivermectin is the cure. We don't need vaccine vaccines. We just all need to take loads of ivermectin. It, 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 bizarre things like this that would never have occurred to me. So I think there's actually a heck of a lot of you know sociology that we need to to get into to understand how the public are using the science that they come across. Um, you know that we we, we just didn't realize. And that that it's very easy to politicize science because of the probability involved. You can pick whichever side you want, and you'll have an argument on both sides. Perfectly valid. Yeah. And uh, once you start to do that, then scientific merit just goes down the drain. Mm-hmm. And I, I bear many scars from that, unfortunately, starting from the Brookhaven reactor all the way to nanoparticles, where you know I've been asked, are they really going to take over the world? That was that book. <laughs> oh, I forget the name. Yeah, Mike Crichton like pray. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. I've been asked that. And, and somebody asked me, are they bad? So then I told him, which was a mistake, you've got a, uh, you've got a smart fire detector in your house, right? Yes. Are you going to go to the library and start to read books to it now? It's a different kind of smart. Uh, the guy got up on the podium and said, see, science at all costs. <laughs> They're making fun of us. It's, it's, one has to know how to explain it, and it's very important because these people mm-hmm. are the decision makers. It's not yeah. us. Yeah. Well, I think that we've we've overrun overrun our yes. time, and I and it's very late for you. I think during yes, our, it's, it's midnight in Jerusalem. And <laughs> that's a wonderful way to end the the meeting. Thank you both for the incredibly stimulating. Uh, talks and thank you everyone who stayed. I hope I'll be talking to both of you both on and offline uh, in the near future. And thank so with you. that I'll bring the meeting to a close. Thank you both to our to both of our speakers again. Okay, thank I'll you so you. much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.